Um, the speaker view, should I be seeing the screen, the story of, of plastic? Yes, and you should see whoever's talking in a little screen by it. I just thought yeah. instead of having a bunch of silent folks, <laughs> that we may, <laughs> may want to see some pretty. <laughs> um, I, th I think I'm on the right screen. I see you, and okay. I don't see it. Well, that's, that's very touching. I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's how it's supposed to be, yeah. So. That's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're gonna... Okay, hi, everybody. Um, we're gonna get started. People are probably gonna start trickling in. Um, my name is Irene Demers. I'm with Iowa Interfaith Power and Light, and we're so excited to be able to host this panel with the Interfaith Green Coalition of Central Iowa today, um, and on the story of plastic. So um, that either if you haven't watched it already, we'll share the link again so you can watch it by 10 p.m. tonight. Um, but I know that it was a really powerful documentary for me, and I'm really excited. Um, to have our panelists talk about it. Um, so again, um, we're gonna ask people while the panelists are speaking to remain muted so speaker view shows up. Um, we are going to be dropping different links as people talk um, in the chat box. Um, so usually you can find the chat box, it's a little like bubble thing that says chat on the bottom. It could be on the top if you have an iPad. Um, we are recording this, so we will be sharing it sometime next week once we get the um, video edited. Um, so that's about it. Um, so I'm going to uh, do some quick introductions um, before we dive into our panel. Um, so I'm going to share this screen. These are our wonderful panelists. Um, CG. Matrician uh, is uh, the owner of Recycle Me Iowa. Um, she's an Iowa native. She's a small business owner, advocate, speaker, traveler, so much more. Uh, she started her own business, Recycle Me Iowa, um, in 2010, when she's not working to disrupt the waste in industry um, and inspiring others like us to live sustainably. She enjoys spending time outdoors, walking, hiking, biking, and kayaking. Um, I should probably go kayaking with her sometime. I love kayaking. Um, we have Stephanie Kellogg Hefner. Um, she is a member at St. Paul UMC in Cedar Rapids, and she's a member of the Be Healthy, Be Green team. She's a Cradle United Methodist, a clergy family member, and again, a member of the St. Paul's in Cedar Rapids. She's the co chair of Be Healthy, Be Green. Um, she also spearheaded plastic. Free July and her congregation last year that was incredibly successful. She's an artist, a parent, adorer of plants, and is in constantly in awe of creation in all the ways that we're all connected. And our last panelist is Elizabeth Sheldon. She is a sustainability student at Central College in Pella. Um, she's a senior this year and she's, like I said, studying environmental sustainability and she's minoring in political science. She's an avid environmentalist and is looking forward to continuing her work in community organizing, waste reduction, and stewardship as she enters the workforce. Um, so as you can tell, we have a really cool panel and we're very excited to hear from everyone today. Um, we're gonna, so just a gentle reminder, everyone needs to be on mute. Um, and if I mute you and you haven't, and you realize I muted you, don't, don't feel offended. <laughs> um, so we're going to start with our questions. Um, and this is going to be geared to all the panelists. Um, I'm going to figure something out really fast, make sure she's muted. There we go. Um, I'm going to invite everyone to tell us a little bit more about um, yourselves and what got you interested in sustainability and environmental justice work. And I'm going to invite CG to share first. 
Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming. I love seeing people get so interested in waste reduction and understanding the systems with plastic and just where things come from and where things go. Um, so my, I grew up pretty green. Um, my, I have a huge family. We always did secondhand everything. And real quick, is it noisy on my end? I think it's just fine. I can hear some of the, I think, recycling, but I feel like that is very on point for today. <laughs> yes. Um, so I um, just kind of grew up with uh, the kind of mindset, you know, turn off the lights. My mom says she was green before it was cool. Um, but what really uh, brought things um, to the forefront for me was right after college, um, I moved to New Zealand and I lived out of a van for seven months and traveled around and that country was just so inspiring to me and I noticed a lot of waste in the in this beautiful country and just kind of everywhere that I turned it seems like I was always talking about recycling and um, my dad had a junkyard so when I was young I would go and pick up all the cans in the junk cars and recycle them so it's just kind of all been a part of my part of my life um i did a persuasive speech in college and with all that information i did such a good persuasive speech that i persuaded myself to take action so it's kind of kind of just comes into my life all the time so that's that's my story and then when i moved back from new zealand um I lived in an apartment and there was no recycling services available. So I just made a bunch of phone calls and solved the problem. Awesome. I'm gonna invite uh, Stephanie to, to share a little bit about herself and her interests. Yeah, um, hello everyone. Um, well, I guess just start at the beginning. Um, my mom always modeled a consciousness about waste um, growing up, so I was just always aware of it. And um, I would say that I've kind of always been sort of mindful, and I'd say sort of, that's pretty accurate. Um, I did some make basic changes and stuff, but um, I feel like it really solidified for me in the last several years as I became more aware of how serious the climate crisis is and um, awareness from indigenous activism um, so i knew that well i i have to do more than i am doing um, also the united methodist women organization um, organized a climate justice study a few years ago and our um, be healthy be green committee was formed in response to that um, and our Reasoning is that, well, first of all, for Christians, we believe the, you know, that creation was created by God and called it good. And so we are called to be stewards and not take more than we need and, and all that. But a second part of that is in scripture, we are um, instructed to care for the most vulnerable people on the planet including widows, immigrants, and the least of these. And so in our time, some of the most vulnerable populations are those impacted the most by climate change and pollution. That's something we saw in the film somewhat. Um, so though that includes those who are or will become climate refugees, those who are subject to environmental racism, which I feel like we saw in the film where we just send our garbage to somebody else. Um, people of color whose neighborhoods are located next to industrial pollution, which also we saw in the film, um, and therefore the church must act on environmental justice and the climate emergency. So I felt that not only was I as a human being called to make personal changes and fight for change on a larger scale, but my church and my, my faith was calling me and that requires me to share with other people who share my faith. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. And um, I'd like to invite Elizabeth. Hi, um, I would say my, my environmental path and like 
turning me into an environmentalist. I would started around junior year of high school when I became a vegetarian uh, after just watching Food Inc. the documentary in one night and I was like, nope, I'm not okay with this system. And so I became a vegetarian that night and it was a little different for me. My parents never supported me on environmentalist actions. Um, so like the first six months of me being vegetarian, I completely learned how to cook for myself because no one wanted to be a part of that. Um, and I honestly would say like, it's nice to have parents that like have a, instilled this type of thinking into you, but at the same time, the rebellious side of me was like, well, screw you, I'm going to take care of the environment. So <laughs> that kind of pushed me further. Um, and I, I felt, I found that that is like the largest passion I have is doing something that's way bigger than me. Um, and I ended up getting a sustainability award at Central and then now I'm attending Central and I'm going to be a senior in college and uh, just doing an a interview to get that scholarship. I got to meet a couple of really great mentors there like Brian Campbell and Giselle who left our college but um, they saw the fire and the passion that I had and they put me into a position right away as a freshman as the head of waste management um, and I got really into understanding zero waste lifestyles as well as structural shifts, which they talked about a lot in the film that like zero waste lifestyles are not going to be the thing that fixes this, but I'll still do it just because it keeps my day to day morale up. <laughs> um, and then as I studied abroad, I saw that climate change really isn't as distant as I had envisioned it. Um, I saw it at the front door of many sustenance farmers in Latin America, um, came back and I decided community organizing was my new thing that I wanted to take on. Um, so that's what I've been really looking at today because I've discovered that fighting climate change is much better, bigger than me. Um, and my naive idea that I'm going to save the world when I was stepped into college is not even close to that phrase any longer. Now as a senior, it's like we are going to work to help our world. Um, there's no saving and there's no like I, but um, that was a big shift for me. and. That's how I'm an environmentalist now, and I hope to keep on growing in a good path that I think I have so far. Yep, so that's me. Thank you. Aren't you guys all excited to hear more from these uh, three ladies? Um, so yesterday was Juneteenth, and we are in an environment where we are remembering Black Lives Matter and racial justice and quality, and um, racial justice is an integral part of environmental justice. So. This documentary really highlights um, that racial justice and inequality are essential parts of our environmental movement. Um, I'm wondering how the three of you are going to be integrating that into your work, ministry, your business um, previously, or what are, what are changes that you're going to be making uh, moving forward? So I'd like to invite uh, CG to start us off. Um. One of the ways that we have designed this uh, designer system, um, we started out doing recycling for apartments and we kept the cost of that so low that we could take care of um, a broad range of socio socioeconomic um, uh, levels. So we have several arms of revenue so we can kind of help more with being able to balance out uh, how we make our money. Um, and then for our, uh, we have zero waste events. So we set up really nice zero waste stations at all events. Um, and we are able to donate some money from the recycling of the cans and bottles that are gathered at those events to help um, like uh, to be donated for uh, food, food scarcity. Um, and we also just were an equal opportunity employer. We have a very, very diverse uh, staff, which I'm really proud of. And it just kind of happened naturally just through connecting with individuals. And so it's been really great to learn um, to have so many different uh, backgrounds and lifestyles that are connected to the business as a whole. And then we just opened up a can redemption center. So um, it's very needed uh, in the community. It does not make a lot of money, but it is definitely a service that has been requested and needed, especially in these difficult COVID times. 
Yeah, and I think that might be a good segue into um, exactly um, with your work. At, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Recycle Me Iowa in case people weren't able to check out your website and whatnot? Yep, so I started Recycle Me Iowa 10 years ago because I was living in an apartment complex and there was no recycling. Um, every phone call that I made was just Band-Aid answers of this is how you start a program in your building. And I said, I thought, no, people need an actual service. So once the uh, drop-off sites were removed from grocery stores and Walmarts and all of that, um, they began uh, curbside recycling for households. So within that, they left out 73,000 apartment units um, in the Des Moines Metro. So you had all of these people that didn't have, possibly did not have access to a vehicle. Uh, the drop-off sites were located nowhere. So we started out just focusing on that. And immediately, as soon as we got any press, uh, business owners called us and said, nobody will help us. We either don't gather enough materials for it to be cost effective, or my landlord will, it will not provide it for us. So we started helping them. And then as soon as, um, I think it was in the first six months of business, uh, New Belgium Brewery, which is um, uh, a brewery out of Colorado, they make Fat Tire, is one of their most popular beers. Um, they were way ahead of the trend with sustainable practices being part of their, uh, part of their system. So I've modeled my business kind of after them, um, but they were in town. They said, we have a, an event, come, we have an event. We want it to be zero waste. And there was over 600 plus, 600, uh, 600 people. And we diverted 92% of the waste from that entire event. So it was just like an extreme eye opening awakening to see that if, if the processes are there, then it works. So um, we did that, and then on June 1st, we started a redemption center. So um, we average about 25,000 containers a day, and we have not advertised or marketed to anybody yet. So thank you. And again, congratulations. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite Stephanie uh, to share a little bit on the question. OK. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> oh, I'm just in racial injustice. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I wish I had a better answer than I do. Um, but what we, what I do have is that injustice is one of the main reasons that UMW got into this in the first place. Um, and so in a way, like the efforts that we've done within our church of reducing waste in the first place, um, getting away from disposables at church and in our personal lives and, and et cetera, um, that reduces our contribution to some of that trash that ends up other places. Um, I wish it was more than, than just that, but that is something that counts for a lot, I think. Um, you know, for a, a church that's been around for a hundred whatever plus years, to change something is pretty cool. Um, and also as a UMW chapter and church, we support missions of the church that, and we do have missions that work in justice issues and environmental issues. Um, but as far as more local matters, um, like what CG was talking about, like different neighborhoods or, I wish I had a better answer and I think that I've overlooked that. And so that is something that I would like to explore and I am open to hearing any ideas about that. What could a church do or an individual do? I would, I want to keep working on that. I'm going to keep that in mind for our and town. I, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a very honest reflection of probably where all of us are after watching that documentary. I mean, I opened my fridge and saw like how much plastic was around vegetables and other things. And, you know, slowly we're just saying, we're buying, we're going to make our own tortillas and not buy corn tortilla packages and things like that. But those are yeah. small things, but it gets There's you one thinking. Angle that I thought of, like thinking as far as like the zero waste lifestyle, that is something that is not accessible to every person. And so that is maybe one aspect that I want to look into is finding ways to connect 
people or provide resources for people who want to live more zero waste or low waste that don't have access. So that's something. Yeah, um, my response. Oh, okay. So I've mostly been looking into environmental injustice and particularly environmental racism in the past year, um, and even more so in this last semester. And I think one of the biggest steps for me to get into everything was to understand that um, that I cannot be the leader and the like voice of a movement that has not directly impacted me and I have no place doing so. Um, especially with the environmental racism, we can just see all of the cases in Houston of um, all of these different low-income black communities that aren't even receiving municipal facility services when low-income white communities are and seeing that difference. And it, I, I think I've had to learn that um, First, when I go into that world, I need to act as an ally as well as an accomplice rather than the leader. Um, and I think that's a big step for me because I love leading and I always go into that role. Um, and just understanding that like I have white privilege and how can I use it to help um, but not take over the scene was like my biggest thing that I've been working on in this past year. Um, and even more so with like the George Floyd uh, thing that's going on right now. And all of that, I, I'm following what the Black Lives Matter movement is telling me to do, not trying to push in my own opinions when I, it's their story that needs to be shared, not mine. Um, and so going to those protests and being a part of the movement of education. Um, but then looking at uh, like the waste side of things, when I was studying abroad in Merida, Mexico, and it's in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, I started running that every two weeks I was doing trash pickups around our neighborhood with all of the central students. And we were hoping to get good news coverage, which we did, um, as well as just like hoping that the community can see that we care about where we are and that we wanna be able to help them and be a part of it without looking elitist in that action, of course, but um, taking a, separating those recyclables, taking it to the recycling truck that I interned at and separating all of those. And then it, um, just showing the community that we care and that it's, it is unjust that their streets are covered in litter um, and that they're forced to live in that area um, and just due to income and where they are at in life. Um, and then at the recycling truck itself, my job was to be teaching people in Spanish how to, um, how to sort all their recyclables and how they can be a part of like this movement of lowering waste. Um, and that was really exciting. I think I have a lot to go <laughs> and that is nowhere near even a good start and I'm ready to keep on pushing. Um, and just so far I've been going to as many uh, different cultural events as possible and just being there and supporting it. And especially at my college, I'm at like all of the Latin American events and I'm trying to go to the Black Lives events as well and just supporting and showing that like the person that runs sustainability at our campus are supporting all of these different things. And, then finding a way to integrate with each other and make plans of our own and make events of our own um, is going to be my hope for this next year. That's what I was going to be doing this last semester, but then school got uh, online. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I think that kind of is a good little segue into, um, so the term throwaway living is used in this documentary a lot. Um, I want to unpack a little bit more about what it means to each of you and the work that you do. Um, I know it's very integral in Recycle Me, Iowa, and work that you do with sus sustainability, Elizabeth and uh, Stephanie. Um, so, um, but one of the questions is, is there appropriateness of some um, throw away living and like products and whatnot? Um, and so what's good about it? What's bad about it? Um, I'm going to invite uh, CG to start us off. Um, so throwaway living, um, I can, I see a lot of different, uh, professions where they don't have a choice. Um, medical professionals is a big one. Um, so I, I'm real careful to 
I, I very much encourage and support zero waste living and any step that you can make is, is better. Um, we are, we do have plans to create an online zero waste store. And with that, I want to have a buy one, give one program. So some things that you purchase, we will then give one to um, someone in the community that, that is interested in being environmentally friendly and um, doesn't have the income um, to do it. So Tom's Shoes is a great example. They, for every pair of shoes that's purchased, they give one away. Um, so there's business models that are able to do that. Um, we also work with uh, uh, children with uh, uh, mental, dis mental and physical disabilities, and they need straws to drink out of. Um, so you can, you can have straws available if they're compostable or paper. There's just some little adjustments that you can make. So there are gonna be some things that you have, you have to throw away. Um, I know my fiance has asthma, so um, we collect all of his inhalers and every month I'm like, I'm gonna find out where we can, where we can send those. Um, so there, there are times where, you know, you do need that aspect, but there's also some adjustments that you can make with purchases. So you can still be environmentally friendly. And when you throw that away, it, it will be composted or degrade better than something such as like a, a styrofoam container, which never degrades. Thank you. I'm gonna invite Stephanie to respond. Hey. Um, yeah, I also am not 100% all plastic, especially medical uses. Um, if you need plastic for a medical reason or like a, a physical reason, you need to take care of yourself. So definitely um, don't feel any kind of guilt about using plastic when it's really needed. Um, and plastic is sometimes the most appropriate material, but um, we can't deny that we've been flooded with um, throwaway products. Um, and for a lot of folks, it's like wonderfully convenient and makes life easier and better. And like, they're kind of right. But if you look at it another way, you know, we're just, we're causing a problem for other people. And um, like our economic system um, runs us down, we're underpaid, and we don't have enough social support, so we turn to these disposable products just to get through the week, um, like the prepackaged food or whatever, because um, we just don't have time or energy or money to do otherwise. So I really, I don't judge people for, um, you know, using whatever product they, they want to use. Um, just because not everyone has the energy or access or time or whatever. So I don't blame consumers. Um, if you have like the privilege and access and ability to do some of those zero waste practices, then um, like Elizabeth said, you just kind of do it for your own morale. <laughs> and um, just to make that little dent that you personally can. But I think that this, I totally blame industry <laughs> and they created this mess and it's their responsibility to to fix it so yeah i do think that we live in a throwaway society but it's not really our fault <laughs> no it's petroleum <laughs> as we learned right um i'd like to invite uh, elizabeth stephanie you kind of took the words right out of my mouth um <laughs> i I full heartedly agree in a lot of medical facilities it is necessary, especially in the light of COVID. Um, having clean, like disposable things used for taking care of an ill person, it will prevent further illness. Um, and that is seen as more acceptable. And also just to, the, the fact that lower income Americans due to the subsidies in our agriculture business and the agriculture industry are forced to only be purchasing this junk food that is um, happens to be high in plastic usage and high in packaging and it's cheaper for them to get more calorie dense foods than more nutrient dense foods. Uh, it's cost a lot more money. They're gonna 
purchase more Twinkies and um, like all of the, just all of the, like like Pop-Tarts as the morning breakfast and it's all covered in uh, packaging that's going to end up in Indonesia maybe or um, anything else. But it's not their fault that the government subsidizes corn heavily or soy heavily so then they are able to do anything they want with those products and chemically alter them to create these processed foods and that's all low-income communities can use and so then they have higher waste um which is not their fault and it's also not their fault with the health issues that come along with that but that's a whole another story um <laughs> but the uh, blaming the consumer is almost never okay and that I think when that does happen that does come from a place of privilege um I'm able to get a second job to try to be able to buy more sustainably for grocery shopping this summer but and not everyone is able to do that and feed their family and keep a roof over their head um and so I think pushing at the government for changing where they're subsidizing their food is really really important as well as changing the industries and maybe giving them incentives for more, going more zero waste or also doing bans. Um, I think attacking at the consumers is useful sometimes for plastic bag bans and plastic straw bans, but that's not going to be the solution. That's just a band-aid on a cheating wound. So that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so there there was a lot of talk about recycling where does our recycling go we saw a man who's in the recycling business who was hopeful and trying to do the best that he can um so i'm gonna this one's for cg um so what are the pros and cons of being in the recycling business right now um, the pro is it is one of the first steps that people can take that's easy to start their sustainable process as I hear over and over again from people saying, oh my gosh, we started recycling and we have hardly any trash. The only thing we have in our trash is, um, you know, some plastics and food. So it's kind of that big first step that's, that's easy, even though recycling is kind of complicated. Um, at, in Des Moines, we do not accept a lot of plastics that most of the world does which is why we're in this crisis of plastics and it was being blamed on the recyclers. So I really love how this movie um, explained how hard it is to, um, uh, to recycle the hard to recycle plastics and it messes up the systems. Um, the good news is there are things in the recycling world that uh, don't lose their value. So glass and aluminum are your top two um, uh, devices that you or materials that you can uh, that you can recycle. They they re they're recycled over and over again and don't lose their value. So there still is there still needs to be some sort of recycling process out there because putting it in the landfill is just the last option um, that you want. So I was really impressed with how this um, how this documentary portrayed the recycling world because. The last few years we've kind of been blamed as as part of the problem when we're just trying to be a part of the solution thank you and i'm i'm glad that that was helpful for you <laughs> um really open very eye-opening um so this question is going to be for um elizabeth so as a sustainability student and someone who's real an organizer on their campus for that um what would you recommend to other students um, what they can do on their campuses to push for sustainability practices and change? Um, I would say that as many different majors and people would say in the real world that connections are everything. Um, and so if you have an idea or something that you wanna see changed, like recycling on your campus, doing it with connections is gonna be the best possible way to do it. Um, for me, I work with Brian Campbell, who's the uh, director of sustainability on campus, and um, he has he's worked with me my freshman year when I was pushing for recycle bins um, to be in all of the dorm rooms since we didn't have that. And um, then as I've gotten to continue on, it's also been about connecting with students around me because they can help me develop ideas and 
that can help me like find new ways of looking at a problem and an issue and seeing how to solve it and then having a bigger group to push towards and advocate for something will usually yield much better results and so just pushing for anything but most importantly to me is like social and um, environmental and economic sustainability on campus having community and having relationships is going to just change everything um yeah <laughs> that's been the biggest thing i've learned in all of life yep. thanks and um so this question is going to be for stephanie um if you were only able to give one tip on how to live sustainable sustainably and um, low waste, what would it be? So what's one thing in our daily lives that we should be doing to reduce waste? Yeah, um, I do have one that is has multiple parts. <laughs> um, basically, well, you can refer to that graphic, the hierarchy of needs. Um, like the first step is to stop buying things. <laughs> Um, don't go out and buy the sustainable versions of things. Just use what you have. Shop your house. Take care of your stuff. Use it till you can't use it anymore. When you do need to replace something, try finding it used. And if you can't find it used, then go buy whatever it is in a form that's going to last. That at the end of its useful life can be composted or recycled. Find other things in our lives that bring us happiness because our buying habits are not sustainable. So my favorite thing is just stop consuming. Do something else. That's, how's that for one tip? <laughs> I think that's pretty solid. And we will send out that graphic to everybody so you can have it. It's really helpful. Um, and this will be for all of you and Stephanie, you can kick us off on this um, because I look to you for this information. <laughs> do you have any favorite brands that do a good job of producing um, like their sustainable products? They have environmentally friendly packaging. What could you recommend for us? Okay, so I want to say yes, I do know of some brands that do a pretty good job. I'm also not really super comfortable recommending brands. I'm very like, I can, um, you know, no worries. I, I am like just not trusting of companies unless it's like a small business where I can, where I know where they work. I know where they make their stuff. So I feel like every time you put your trust into something, you're going to find out like, Oh, they were lying about something. So, and I don't like necessarily want to endorse products, but there are like a number of, um, personal, like, like toiletries and beauty items that I think are pretty good and I can share, but I don't know. <laughs> Do you want to know what they are? <laughs> I don't need to put you on the spot or okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> More like there's, um, like things do exist. Like, yeah. Like, um, so I, one of the ways like, that I find out about stuff is just browsing um, like zero waste shops or low waste stores, um, but still like being critical about what it is like, cause it could be so tempting to just see, oh, it's like this shiny new sustainable thing. I need it like a, a stainless steel water bottle. Well, I have like six plastic water bottles at home that are fine. I don't need to go buy another one and some of my other ones wear out. But as far as like um, the kinds of products that I need to like use and use up like um, shampoo or deodorant or dental floss and stuff, I use brands that package in paper, have no packaging or packaging glass. Like my dental floss, I'll drop a name brand here. Um, it's Dental Lace. It comes in a glass jar. The, it's made out of silk so you can compost it and then the refills come in compostable packaging. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking for is at the end of it, there's no waste other than like, depends on if I can figure out how to recycle the metal cap on the jar. But hopefully I'll be able to use it for like 30 years or something. So, so that's what I look for. Um, one shop that I buy from is bring your own Long Beach in California, um, just because they typically have things in stock that I need. But Iowa has a couple new shops, 
relatively new. There's the collective in Des Moines and Zero Waste Mercantile in Ames. So if you're wanting to check out some sources, those are some new sources in our state. Perfect. Um, maybe I'll try to refresh that question a little bit. Um, so, <laughs> um, what are some things, so let me, I'll, I'll rephrase it this. So what's a good first step in reducing your consumption of plastic um, at home and at work with things, maybe certain products, maybe not, but um, we're just looking for some <laughs> recommendations. Um, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to answer first. Um, I would say some of the biggest are going to be food waste because that's where almost like all waste from people come from. And so I like going to different bulk stores. I go to Campbell's that's in Des Moines on University Ave. And um, I know there's a couple more like Fresh Time. Um, and so I try to get things in bulk if I can, and I bring my own produce bags. And then for getting those products itself that I can take to the store, I tend to use Package Free Shop, um, and they're from New York. And I also, like Stephanie, there's probably some stuff that's being lied about or um, aren't as like green as they say it is. Um, but they do show where their products are sourced from and um, like what they're made from, are they fair trade products or not? And then um, they're able to send it to you with no packaging and then those products themselves are zero packaging. Um, I like to use bar soap, conditioner, everything. Um, also the floss, the bamboo toothbrushes. Um, this might seem a little out there, but menstrual cups can reduce women's waste tenfold um, and save money. And so I support Dot Cup that um, donates a cup to a woman in need across the world and which is really important because a lot in a lot of third world communities women are um, forced to stay home for a week a month out of a month um, so top cup is really incredible so those are those are some big things for me I package free shop Campbell's top cup those are like three things that I I do support I hope I'm not name dropping and that it turns out they're homophobic or something <laughs> I know that has happened in the past, but um, yeah, those are my recommendations. Thank you. And I'll invite CG to answer and maybe introduce your friend. These are my nieces, Libby and Lucy. And Libby takes after me and loves to pick up litter and loves recycling and animals. So um, I will validate what Elizabeth said about those stores, um, I know the owners personally, and they're they're fantastic. Um, there's uh, even store big corporations such as like Patagonia and North Face, where you can, if your jacket is ruined, um, you can send it back to them and they'll fix it. So um, there's a lot of great brands out there. Uh, Brush with Bamboo. So once you need to get a new toothbrush, you can order from a zero waste store um, or get like a brush with a bamboo toothbrush. And then that toothbrush can be composted as well. Um, so again, uh, the, the materials that you wanna look for are glass, metal, and uh, silicone. So if you wanna focus just on uh, material wise, compostable and recyclable and, and recyclable uh, glass, metal, and um, silicone is not recyclable, but silicone is actually made from sand. So it's an environmentally friendly uh, material. Thank you. Um, so this documentary was hard to watch in a lot of ways, um, but I know for me there were some moments of hope um, while watching this documentary. Um, so uh, I'm gonna get, pass it to Stephanie this time, and um, what were the, what was hopeful in, in the documentary for you? Um, like, to be honest, like, my, like, biggest response is pessimism, <laughs> because it's such a large, like, um, thing that we're up against, um, but just seeing those activists working within their own communities, 
I felt was hopeful. Like those are people who love where they live and they want to take care of it. And so just seeing the, the humans um, doing things for the good of everyone else, that was hopeful. Awesome. Elizabeth, how about you? Seeing a journalist that was covering the, um, how things are actually made in the production of it instead of just focusing on that last part of the trash in the ocean really spoke to me. And I was excited that there is getting coverage on, there is coverage on that now because uh, the Ban the Straw movement was cool, but I was frustrated the whole time. Um, I, like, it's not really the getting at the root of the problem. Um, and so seeing that, seeing that there was a journalist out there that has been talking to environmental activists and does see that there's so much more to the story it gave me hope that there will be more coverage because I think journalism is one of the best like best things that environmentalists can use because journalists investigate and journalists cause change and, and you can see that through history with a ton of different politicians being called out due to investigative journalism. Um, so that's been big on my theme category for the past two weeks. I've been watching the Epstein series or Epstein series and they've been talking about investigative journalism and I've been all in it. So that gave me a lot of hope with this documentary. <laughs> Thanks. What about you, CG? Repeat the question real quick. <laughs> Dang it, I was almost good the whole time. Uh, what was something that gave you hope in the documentary? Um, I'm glad it's getting coverage. So it's pointing, it's discussing things that, like I was discussing 10 years ago and people were like, oh, you're, you're an environmentalist. Good job, you're doing good. So now it's like, you know, zero waste stores are popping up all over, you know, 10 years ago, I would bring my own, you know, Tupperware container into a restaurant and I'd be like, I know I'm weird, but I don't want styrofoam. I'm bringing my own container. Um, straws. Once the video of the turtle with the straw in its nose, everybody was like, I'm done using straws. I refuse, refuse the straw. Um, so just the fact that it's, it's, I say trash is trending. Um, it's been, it's always hard to educate the masses and stuff like this. Um, it, it's not, it, it talks about, you know, the corporations and what their, their, their role in this is plus individuals. And, um, it's not just one sided. So, um, don't hate me, Elizabeth, but I am a meat eater. Um, it's healthy for my body and I can support local farmers, um, which is a positive thing. So it's, I liked how this uh, documentary showed several areas and, um, you know, they're, they're bringing all these materials to low economic locations, which is horrible. Um, the good news about the recycling industry is it does provide jobs. So like some jobs are good jobs with good wages and whatnot. So there's more jobs being created in the sustainable uh, area. Um, and I do know um, the conference I went to this last August, um, for the first time, the waste industry and the people who make the waste are finally communicating. So Colgate is working on different material to change to you know change their their branding and the packaging that they use because they're hearing from cons consumers um, so that gives that I think was gave me more hope awesome so I'm going to invite uh, Alyssa um, to talk a little bit about policy she's one of our call to climate action student leaders um, and she's going to tell a little bit about what the landscape on plastic and policy in Iowa looks like right now, or doesn't look like. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. More than anything, the landscape is pretty barren um, right now when it comes to plastic uh, being brought up in policy, at least in a beneficial way. Um, so this year's uh, legislative session was really short uh, due to corona, kind of 
cut cut down on time and stuff. And so I'm going to talk really quickly about one policy that was maybe not so good when taking into consideration the environment um, and how that was passed, and then how we had a some good policy that was uh, some a good bill that was introduced but then has been effectively left alone and has not been developed further. So um, a bad policy that made it through and a good policy that was left alone. And the importance of then voting and making sure we have representatives who keep uh, like climate change and plastic and all of that good stuff in mind. So yeah, there's not currently too many actionable legislative items. But back in 2017, Terry Branstad signed into legislation or signed legislation into law that bans communities, towns, and counties from having their own bag ban. So for example, I go to school at Lord's, Loris College in Dubuque. So if Dubuque decided that we wanted to put a bag ban into effect, um, we thought that our community could handle it and we wanted to reduce waste and plastic consumption, we wouldn't want, we wouldn't be able to because of state law. Um, and that was also kind of tucked, it, that didn't receive a whole lot of coverage because it was also tucked into a bill that wouldn't allow for um, minimum wage increases in independent cities. So even if Dubuque said, hey, we wanna pay our workers more, um, we can't because of state law. And so that kind of got passed in and that legislation was introduced by a legislation writing company or writing council um that partners very closely with a lot of large companies and they tend to favor their policy tends to favor um capital and profit over people and the environment and that is one example where even if communities are trying to be sustainable they're not being allowed to um, and then another bill that was introduced in february of 2019 this kind of looks at the beginning of plastic so a lot of um a lot of the documentary focus on, okay, we have this issue of plastic and plastic pollution. Um, we're gonna go forward and look at um, like a lot of plastics being made with um, fossil fuels, with natural gas and oil. And so we have on the front end of produce, production, we have fracking, drilling and transportation of natural gas and oil. And that second bill um, that I want to introduce is a, a good attempt at holding natural gas and oil companies accountable for the environmental damage that their actions, specifically constructing pipelines, have. So essentially, the bill would have required that companies cannot um, build pipelines until a uh, uninterested third party would conduct an assessment on what the pipeline's environmental impact would be. And they would only be given a building permit if it was deemed that um, if it was deemed that the the effects would be minimal. Um, and so that basically the bill was just trying to reduce the amount of pipelines being made um, and constructed. And if pipelines are to be made, they're hopefully to be done in a way that would have as little environmental impact as possible. But essentially, immediately after that bill was introduced in February of 2019, it was basically uh, it was sent to the uh, count or the excuse me the committee on commerce and left to die. So it hasn't been touched. Nothing's been done with it because right now representatives do not prioritize um, sustainability efforts. They do not prioritize um, environmental efforts. And so Irene's gonna talk a little bit about the importance of voting, and I just kind of wanted to preface that. So we saw a bill that was harmful, it got passed, no problem. Um, and a bill that would have been beneficial, it was just basically uh, tabled and left to die, and it was sent to an ill-fitting um, committee, like commerce shouldn't be handling uh, bills with pipelines. But um, yeah, so that's just kind of my little two cents. Um, we just need to keep that in mind when we vote in uh, new, new representatives and then hold them accountable throughout their term. Thank you, Alyssa. And in the chat, there is some talk about federal laws, especially um, when we're talking about plastic, we're talking about petroleum, the fossil fuel industry. Um, and that is something we can look at the next couple of relief bills, um, track what the EPA is doing, um, especially if we do see another relief package, um, 
a lot of groups, including Iowa IPL, um, are opposed to obviously those financial incentives to the fossil fuel industry during this time of Corona um, and would love to see more of that money go to renewable energy, clean energy. Um, and the biggest way really is we have an election in November. <laughs> no one's surprised, right? Um, it's coming up. And so uh, we really want to focus on a little bit on voting. So um, National Iowa IPL has a program um, called Faith Climate Justice Voter. And um, that's just a little bit of the web page. And I am going to drop into the chat where you can sign up to become one. Um, so that's just a different way is like, this is the lens in which you vote is you vote with climate justice at the forefront um, as you, you know, fill out your ballot. Um, so that's one way you can do that. Um, really intersectional justice is such a good reason to vote. Um, really with climate action, environmental action, um, this, this is really the election to focus on for this. Um, so for us at Iowa IPL, we are really focused on um, making sure that everyone is registered to vote, that can vote, and everyone that is registered gets to the polls or gets mail-in ballots. Um, in Iowa, we cannot fill out the applications for an absentee until July 6th. Um, so that is something that we will be sending out reminders and to make sure that people are asking for the forms and getting those absentee ballots um, because there's a very set um, timeline for that, um, especially since we don't know um, where we're going to be at with COVID-19 in November. We want people to vote safely, um, and that's really important to us. Um, and another way is just empowering the next generation. I'm really excited that Alyssa was here, Elizabeth, um, CG and Stephanie, myself. Um, a lot of people that are younger, or I, I feel like I'm old now in my mid thirties, but um, we are doing really good work and we can help empower and embolden all the generations, especially from like CG's uh, nieces to our college students. Um, Alyssa is one of our college students that we have and we're so excited to work with them to empower their communities. Um, and then um, one thing we do have uh, coming up in the pipeline um, that we're dreaming about is training people to use social media a little bit better before the election, um, how we can share uh, information in a way that gets out there and is amplified. So we will be, um, our plans are to have a Facebook one-on-one -on -one and then maybe a Twitter one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> so um, we know that not everyone has that. We're currently also um, engaging the Iowa delegation, our congressional delegations to take climate action and hold them accountable. So stay tuned. Um, we want them to support the Paris Agreement. Um, so Again, we are working on two town halls um, that will um, be this summer, um, so stay tuned. Can't give you more details than that, but um, I'm really excited about that and our partners. And um, just keep looking and working with coalitions. Um, it's, it's work we do, and um, we try to get out that information about how to apply clean energy to make sure net metering um, is passed, um, which we did um, last legislative session. Um, just, there's some, I feel like there's a lot of things in the pipeline. Um, and I'm just trying to be mindful of our time here. Um, so I wanna um, invite our panelists just to, for like a last thought, how um, unfortunately we're running out of time for a Q and A. I apologize for that, but we just had so much good information from our, um, lovely panelists. So I'd like to hear from uh, CG first uh, on your closing thoughts. Um, this was amazing. Uh, I, I loved all of it. I love how many people were interested. Uh, closing thoughts, um, reduce, reuse, and then recycle. Recycle is the last one. So don't forget the, the other two. Um, I've also added refuse, reduce, reuse. Um, uh, so that, and then uh, policy work-wise, um, 
your voice does make a difference. Um, I know that with the links that you're going to send out, I'll send out uh, links to our Facebook and Instagram page. Um, because once the bottle bill, the bottle bill is always trying to be thrown out from the grocer associations. And when people flood uh, with phone calls and emails, uh, they're heard. And I know that firsthand from politicians that there's no way that they could get rid of the bottle bill because of how many people said, please don't. And I just got the stats from today. We uh, redeemed over 41,000 uh, containers in four hours, and that put over $2,000 in people's pockets. So when the system is done right, it makes sense. So thank you so much and congratulations. We really appreciate you, you participating today. Elizabeth, what are your last thoughts? Um, I thought that CG and Stephanie had some really cool stuff to say. CG, that company sounds incredible, and I'm definitely going to look into it more. And Stephanie, I really, really liked what you have to say, and I would love to talk to you at any time about further environmental justice movements and how we can be allies and push that in a context like a church, but also a college campus. Um, and yeah, I agree. I just shared the message. When the system is done right, it makes sense. I agree, CG. <laughs> just great points all around. Um, I think that policy is going to be the biggest change that we can possibly make. Um, and so being politically active and staying involved in groups like this is going to make a change for our, our nation and then hopefully I will at some point. So please go to all of your community climate strikes. Go to everything that you can. Be involved. That's my closing thought. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, Stephanie. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge, um, like, I'm a white person, and I know a lot of us here are as well. So I want to acknowledge the um, incredible work that Black, Lat Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of color, that activism and um, their practices that they've been doing forever already and that you know some of these things that we're just now catching on to um i'm pretty active on the low waste instagram community and from what i see from like black and latinx um instagrammers they have pointed out that um their families have already been doing a lot of these low waste practices they're just not as fancy as the way we do them. So they're already doing things. We have so much to learn from indigenous um, black people of color in these fields, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you, Alyssa. Alyssa and another Alexandria, she wasn't here, uh, were my support team from our college students and were really instrumental in helping me put together the questions for our panelists. Um, I, Lois um, is uh, the convener, I'm going to call it convener of <laughs> the um, Interfaith Green Coalition, and I thought I saw, if you want to unmute yourself and just say hi and let everyone know about the next meeting for the, uh, uh -huh. okay, I hear, yay, there you are. <laughs> um, I don't know what we're going to do yet in July. Um, because of the the virus um, one possibility is to uh, discuss the meeting that Channing is having on zoom this coming Friday I sent that out to people and I think a lot of people on this um, zoom meeting have probably received it but Channing Dutton is concerned that uh, climate is getting kind of lost in all that's going on right now and we're kind of get together to brainstorm what we might do to continue working on that. Um, so I can't really say what the meeting will be, except we will be doing something on the third Saturday of uh, July. So, okay, glad to see everybody. And thank you for IIPL for doing this for us. It's very good and very informative, even though the film for me was pretty much of a downer. <laughs> it was kind of discouraging, but, um, I'm glad to hear that people are working on it. So, so thanks again. Yeah, thank you. And I'm gonna um, 
unmute you all so we can give our panelists a huge round of applause and um, thank you for coming. And we'll have a follow-up email with a link to everything. So, yay! Thank you, everybody. Yay. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank of you. Course. One day we'll meet in person. <laughs> I'm going to connect with Stephanie and Elizabeth on helping you get. Um